This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I will bless the Lord, O oh my soul, okay? Rise, shine, give God the glory. And today we have a special guest which is going to be James Cannon. He is the father of one of our uh, favorite celebrities, brother Nick Cannon. And he's going to talk to us today about deep roots and having and establishing a foundation. Brother James, how are you? I'm doing outstanding um, today, and I just appreciate being on your show so very much. Uh, I'm hoping we have enough time to say everything we need to get said today. Yeah. <laughs> We, I'm, I'm sure we do. I hear, I hear you can talk. Yes, yes, indeed. I'm excited about it a lot, and I've been, a, been a participation on this earth for 54 years. So I've got 54 years of experience. I got five sons that I love tremendously: Nick Cannon, uh, Caleb Cannon, Gabriel Cannon, Reuben Cannon, and Javen Cannon. So I'm just appreciative of God that's given me an opportunity to participate. In, in life and in these young men's lives, and then to participate on your show today. Oh, wonderful. So uh, you're a man who has raised five men. Now, how was that? Well, you know, life has been very interesting. I think God has prepared me. You know, all my life I wanted to have sons, and God kind of spoke that into my heart and into my life, so I received it. And I, I think I was ready to be a dad. I had Nick when I was 17. I was still young in high school. Matter of fact, Nick came to my graduation, high school, my, my high school graduation, as a young baby. So um, Nick has been in my life ever since I've been a teenage kid, and I've grown, raised him as a as a young man. My parents were very instrumental in helping. Uh, Nick's mom allowed him to come live with me and my family at two months old. And so uh, Nick has been my little brother slash son all my life. And then having my other five, four boys, I had the privilege after getting a divorce um, to, to their mom. I met their mom the last semester of my college in North Carolina. And I got married my last semester of school, then ended up having my other four sons. And I ended up raising them as a single dad in California, took them to Hollywood High School and enrolled them there. And the rest is kind of history. I love my son. It was an outstanding experience and, and still is. And I had the privilege of do, doing some things with my five sons that most, most fathers don't. So I'm really grateful. Hey, Amen. You've been on, uh, this is a, as you know, this is a, a gospel radio station here, but you've been on a lot of different gospel uh, media outlets before, Christian media outlets, um, for years. Uh, and some of it, is there a ministry that you do or? Well, I appreciate you asking me that. You know, God changed my life at a young age, you know, really, I mean, really dramatically changed my life. You know, I was caught up in that gang banging stuff back in the 70s and 78, 79 as a young kid, young teenage knucklehead kid, you know, um, following the crowd but also trying to lead the crowd. But then God came into my life, kind of like the Apostle Paul experience where God literally broke into my life and began to change some things and show me some things. And even though I was a still a young man in high school, it made the difference in my life to where I never went to jail. I never got caught up in drugs and crazy stuff after that. I I had an earlier experience with juvenile hall and, and marijuana and stuff as a young kid. But after Christ came into my life, he just made such a dramatic difference to where the, all I wanted to do was just talk about the gospel. But there were some other things I had to learn about, like business and family and, and, and being a man. So I went to college to do that in, in Concord, North Carolina, Barber Scotia College, a historical black college in North Carolina. So I got on the bus every Christmas and every summer, and I rode the bus back and forth to North Carolina where I went to school. And so God just began to show me so much, and he's still showing me a lot 
when me and my boys got to Hollywood, you know, God began to share some other things with me. And that's how to really win the loss, how to win Jewish people, how to how to win people of all different ethnicities. And so that's what I'm grateful for, you know, just being on the ground, a young man that loves God, and then to have five sons that love God, I really couldn't ask for a whole lot more. Yeah, and not just putting it out there, but uh, planting seeds. The original reason why I asked you that and um, – uh, we have uh, Albert on the phone, too, who doesn't know this, but a long time ago, Brother James, I was in the room with my mother, and she always loves to play the gospel station on television. It was a gospel uh, television. That, and, and since I'm so used to church, you know, uh, when we grow up like that, we just tune it out. I just hear noise. But I did hear a man that was giving a strong testimony about his past, and I just said, okay, yeah. And um, I turned around. And you were on the screen, and then you said, my son is uh, Nick Cannon. And I said, wait, wait, a, wait a minute. So, yeah, that's how I knew that you have been um, uh, participating in uh, spreading your testimony through different gospel media outlets uh, to encourage young people um, and young men. And I like what you said about how you, you recognize that there was a gap in the education that you uh, filled in by going to school to learn business and getting around people to learn how to uh, be the man that you wanted to live up to your fullest potential. How do you um, see young men today from where you came from with their potential? I think that, I think the youth today is some of the brightest, most intelligent uh, youth that have some of the greatest opportunities. But at the same time, we have a negative force, and we have some pitfalls out there that's trying to trip them up, you know. And when you look behind the scenes and we truly understand that, you know, we live in a country that would rather lock you up in, instead of educating you and helping you become all that you can be. So if there's, there's thousands of pitfalls out there for young men to fall into. And if they're not paying attention and they fall into those pit holes, it could literally sidetrack them for life and, side, and put them on the sideline of life for life. They could even find themselves locked up in a jail cell uh, with 40 or 50 years for just making one or two knucklehead decisions where they were not thinking, where they pick up a gun or where they, where they do something um, crazy to a female that's in their life that caused them to get locked up. There's a lot of pitfalls in the path of young men today. And so because they are some of the most brightest, most intelligent young men that we've ever had to deal with, they've got to be even more careful. It's like a butterfly, a caterpillar that now has wings. Now he's got to be even more careful because now he can fly and get into the sky and see things on a different level, but if he messes up his wings, if he makes a bad decision now, he's got to be even more careful once he becomes a, a butterfly than when he was just a caterpillar. And so the young men today, and I talk about it in my book, I have a book called The Calling. Everybody has a calling, the power of understanding your calling. And I use the metamorphosis, the of the butterfly to illustrate the point. And the point you're asking, our young men and youth today are brilliant, but they got to be careful because our government and other people would rather put handcuffs on them and lock them up and throw the key away. So they got to be careful today, even though they're some of the most brilliant young people that we've ever produced. Amen. Absolutely. I believe that. Yes. And so with this, at the end of the day. yeah, yeah. And, and I'm glad you explained that. I mean, there's really nothing like a man explaining that because I'm a woman. I don't understand that. And um, I think what we just do is uh, uh, try to show support in that area. So how can women be more supportive and at the same time not be negatively affected? or have our support taken advantage of? 
That's beautiful. That's outstanding. Again, because our country has allowed uh, the, the emasculation of our men and of our young men. They would rather see our young boys wearing tight, skinny jeans and, and wearing a poked, uh, uh, a man's uh, um, 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 tying his hair up in, a, in, a, in, in tights and instead of doing things that are more masculine. They'd rather see our men be demasculated. So we need our women to remind the young men that you are a man. Remind them that they love to see a man be a man. And and with that, you know, some women love to see a man uh, be their hairdresser because they're more sensitive and they can talk about women issues. And sometimes, certain times, women like to have men where they can talk about their makeup and talk about their dress. But a man is a man and she be a man, and if women stand up and tell their son, son, you are a man, and you have no problems with who you are in your identity, don't let nobody confuse you to make you think that it's okay for you to be less than what you are, which is a man. Because our government now will give women jobs a lot faster. Afro-American men are still the last hired and the first fired. And where they will escalate our women and help our women become financially independent, they're, they're still afraid of us as men. And so as our women remind us that they love us, as you remind your sons and your brothers and your daddy that I love you and, and I'm with you. If Oprah was to remind Stetman that she loves him and that she would be willing to put all of her billions behind that man, then that man can rise his head and stand up in this society as one of the strongest Afro-American men in this country, but if women like Oprah say, I'm not going to put my money behind him, I don't trust him that much, I don't love him that much to put all of my money and say, you are the king in my life. My point is, even though women today have been given the privilege to earn more money and to become executives in corporations, they've got to remember that God has a plan for the family, and in that he wants his man to be strong. So even though the government, senators, congressmen, lawyers, prison keepers would like to Throw the black man in jail, the black woman has to be there to remind him of who he really is. Uh, okay. So, uh, first of all, first, this is getting ready to get really good right now because I yeah. have, I'm getting ready to learn from you because I'm getting ready to be Oprah for a second here. But first of all, I want to thank you for making that statement about um, women starting with their uh, kids, you know, your son, your brother, your father, lifting them up. Because uh, we get it wrong when we don't get what we need from the house, and then we think that we're supposed to go doing that on the outside, and we don't know what it looks like, and just kind of walking in the dark doing that, it, it can bite back. But if you start in the house and you can de develop something that is going to uh, be able to be uplifting in the world. Your son, you can put that out there. You can't make, you can't create a man that you meet into your son and then try to make him that, you know. But another thing, uh, Mr. James, Brother James Cannon, yes, can you, yes, can yes. you, can you, can, can, can we, you teach me here because I'm going to tell you now, I, I think like that. I think I, I'm going to be Oprah here. If I have billions and I am uh, with a man, honestly, I, because you don't trust him because of what goes on so much. So how can we? And then it happens so much, it's like every time you let your guard down, you're made a fool out of. So it's best to keep it that way. And it's not, to, not that uh, we don't support or I wouldn't support or don't support Stepman because she does mention him very often. It's the situation at home. When someone has been scarred, you really don't want to be – made a fool out of. So why should we take that chance on a man? That's a good question. Well, we have, and, and Stepman and, and Oprah is just an example uh, in, yeah. throughout our country because we have many powerful women 
and we have powerful uh, men as well. But, you know, our country would rather recognize the powerful woman and uplift her and give her a voice and help her. And they still have a desire, again, to, to be afraid of, of us as men. And the person that can help uh, cure that the most is our women. And it's kind of like if America uplifts black people and say black people uh, should be the, 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 the second richest people in the world, the black people in America, and we're going to help them and we're going to give them reparation, not just apologize to black people, but we're going to give them what's due to them and so that they can lift their head again, so the black man can feel proud again. So we owe him reparation, so we're going to give it to him. If America does that, then the Hispanic race, the Italian race, and everybody else will respect the black man again. But they're not going to respect us if America keeps their foot on our neck and keeps calling us boy and less than and treating us disrespectful, even if they know that we are men and that we can handle our families and our money, they would rather put out the narrative that we can't. And so vice versa, if our women don't feel comfortable in trusting us, if our, then how can the other ethnic groups trust us? If, if they lift our women up and let them make become financially independent all over this country, and then they show black men begging in the street in Hollywood, black men begging in the street in New York, and they make it look like black men are the, the dust of this earth when really we the light of the world, then even our women can become confused. And once they mm. get that money, they start saying, well, I don't need a man. I can make it all by myself. I can be both mama and daddy. When they do that, they just fell into the trap. It's a trap. It's a plan. Because the Hispanic women don't talk like that about their men. The Italian women don't talk like that about their men. The Caucasian women don't talk like that about their men. But the Afro-American women, we will, we will denigrate the man because it's by plan. They want you to do that. They want you to say, I don't trust him enough to have a joint bank account with him, even if he is my husband. I don't trust him enough to turn my millions over to him and call him Lord like Sarah did with Abraham. I just don't trust him, and I'm not going to trust him. I'm sorry. That's a plan. That's what they want you to think, because if they can destroy the family, which has been their plan to destroy the Afro-American family in America, and so therefore, if you just look at their plan, now they switched it, so now our women don't trust us. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I don't know about my listeners, um, Mr. James, but I really, I want to thank you for that. I do, yeah. from the bottom of my heart. I thank you for that. I think there's a lot of women out there that we want to do a lot of things and have just been burned, okay, and just kind of can't take it no more. But like you said, it is a trap, and I think that we probably um, – need to continue to pray. I think what happened is we just said, forget it. Like how I just said, you know what, forget it. And we should not get to the point of forget it. Well, you know, right, when you go back go. and look, when you go back when you go back and look at the plan of the trap, it started back in the seventies. You got we got to agree that you know the, the government could have said, in order for women to get a check, we know you've had a man because you got a baby. So a man has been around somewhere. But we want to help you in the family. But to say that the man cannot be present in the family, that wasn't a, a test. They knew what that was going to do. They wasn't trying to see what was happen if they give the woman money and demand her to keep the man out. They knew that was going to destroy our families because, they, I mean, they this been tested and tried for hundreds of years in other places with other people. So when they did that to us, 
it, it, it broke up the confidence of the family. It broke up the confidence because the woman could get money, and the government became the papa. She began to have more confidence in the government than the very man that she laid down and had a baby with. And then us as men, our fathers then, it made it easy for them to get wild. It made it easy for them to hit the door and said, okay, I'm gone. And they knew that too. And so, therefore, you know, going back to Margaret Sanger with uh, Planned Parenthood and the Negro Project, they've been watching us and they've been carrying out their plan on us, but we cannot be so foolish that once we look behind the veil and see what's really been going on, to continue to do it. Women that have a whole lot of money with no man should be looking for a man that they can trust and they can put the strength of their power Power behind that man. Oprah should be looking for a man if Stepman's not the one, but she should be looking for a man that she could say, I trust this man before God, and I will put everything that I have behind him. Just like a man would have to do when he finds a wife that he loves, he gives her his name, and he should put everything he has behind her, and if she has gifts and talents, he should want to help her escalate her gifts and talents to where she could become an Oprah, so she could become a wonder before the world without him being intimidated by that, because this is his woman, and if this is his woman and they trust each other, then that's the plan of God. The world wants to destroy the plan of God for the family and to emasculate the man. So I would say to the women today, don't do it, okay? Don't, don't fall into that trap. Look behind the veil and, and see the true plan of the enemy to destroy the, the, the family, particularly the Afro-American family in this country, because no other minority has went through what we've went through. The Hispanic people are good people. The Italian people are good people. But they have not went through what we went through. The Jewish people are good people. But their families wasn't sold. Their men wasn't made to have intercourse with their relatives just out of spite, just just to destroy them. But that happened to us. Our families were sold. So we've got some extra issues that we've got to deal with and understand that the plan hasn't stopped. They're still coming after our families. So I say the women, you need to be strong and pray to God for insight for the right man, the right man, that you can put everything you have behind with no fear that you're going to be burned. Mm, now that is some deep roots right there. Um, and, again, your book is titled what? I have a book out already called The Calling, which everybody has a calling, how to discover your calling in three days. You can get that on, on Amazon or on the Internet, James Cannon, The Calling. But the next book that I've got coming out, which I'm really proud of and I'm excited about, it's going to be launched at the end of this month, and it's, it's going to open up so many eyes and truths and stimulate conversation, and that's about the O.J. Simpson case because I believe that the white racist media dealt with our brother unfairly. He stood up before a court of law and said, I'm absolutely 100% not guilty of this crime. But yet the media was still able to attack him. Uh, Fred Goldman and their family were still able to attack him. We've had many black people killed in this country by white mobs and the Ku Klux Klan, but we wasn't still able to attack the family members in the media uh, uh, Emmett Till's mom wasn't able to attack the family members in the media and keep hate going on for the people that she believed killed her son. But with Ron Goldman and Nicole, they were set up. O.J. was set up. What he didn't realize was that his house guest, Katie, uh, Kato Kalin, smoothly set him up right from the beginning, and their desire, they were producers, directors of movies, they were, their desire, and I'm putting that in my book, which is called Dear O.J., The Butler Did It, Your House 
guest, Cato Kalen, manipulated the whole thing. Dear OJ, I want to tell you a secret that you didn't know. Because the, the media is not going to tell this secret. Um, uh, Christopher Darden is not going to tell this. Marsha Clark's not going to tell this. But the truth is, OJ Simpson was set up from the beginning by his house guest, Cato Kalen. I, I, I want to ask you a question because I don't want to go any further lost if this is what I think. Um, Brother James, for, as African Americans, do you think that we spend more time than we should uh, wanting equal rights in the negative light uh, rather than um, putting that same energy into not performing initial crime actions? Say, for instance, like you said with the Emmett Till thing, like, yes, we can say that the other didn't get, you know, we weren't able to do the same equal to them. Or in the O.J. Simpson case, we can say, is, is, you know, we can put a lot of that energy into, well, that person did it, and so we should be able to do it and say, let's not make that initial crime because we still have other things going on where people are being racially po profiled for no reason without any criminal activity. So when we have those that have done or performed a crime and they're being unfairly treated in between it and we have to back up a, a and we have to back a criminal based upon being African American, it makes our case uh seem it, it makes it Hard, you know, it's it's hard to help somebody when when that's what's going on. Some of the time. What, are your, what are your thoughts on that? I, I agree with you absolutely, absolutely. Down through our history, many black men have been accused of raping white women and raping women. If they did it, they need to go to jail. If they murdered somebody, they need to go to jail. But many black men have been accused falsely and have went to jail for crimes that they did not commit. And our history mm -hmm. in America is stacked full with cases in every city across this country where white women have accused black men or when mobs of white men, without even looking at the facts, have rushed to judgment and lynched black men. I mean, literally took them by the neck and hung them until they were dead, until their parents had to come cut them down from them trees. Now, if they mm. committed the crime, then they should pay. But if they didn't commit the crime, absolutely not. And every black person in this country should stand up and say, you're not going to lynch my brother, not while I'm alive, not while I'm watching. But a lot of times what black people do, we know that the black person is being lynched. We know that they're treating unfairly because it don't make sense, but we're not going to stick our neck out. We're not going to stick our reputation out. We're not going to say, I stand with my brother because I believe he is 100% innocent. We will listen to the cries of the other people, and when they, they convince us that he's guilty, we'll say, good, that's what he got. He got what he deserved then. But the fact is, if he's innocent, Will we stand with him with that same strength? Case in point, a lot of people think O.J. was guilty. I read every single book on the subject. I, know, I didn't listen to the, 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 the manipulation over the television. I read the books. I read Johnny Cochran's book. I read Marsha Clark's book, Christopher Darden's book. I read Faye Resnick's book. I read both of O.J.'s books. And my conclusion is that my brother did not do it. My conclusion is that if, from reading the book, his house guest did it. And if his house guests set him up, just like uh, Celine Dion's uh, manager, I believe that was her, murdered her, my son is a celebrity. I said, Nick, you cannot trust everybody. You can't bring everybody into your house and bring them around your kids and let them see your secrets. Cato Kalin was a master manipulator from the beginning. And if you do your homework and your research and read some of the books that I've read, you can see behind the scenes that he master manipulated the whole thing, and they wanted to last for 30 years. It wasn't mm. about passion. It wasn't about jealousy. It was a movie script. It was a movie plot. 
They were directors and movie uh, directors and stars. Check out the history of the people that hung around Cato Kalin, and you can see they, they produced a murder mystery movie. Cato Kalin was a master manipulator. O.J. globally brought him into his house, and what I hate about it is the media went along with it. They manipulated the media from the beginning, but the media didn't ask the right questions because it was a black man. If Cato Kalin was a black man living in O.J.'s house and O.J. was a white man and his wife ended up dead they were, and the bloody glove was found behind Cato's house and Cato was a black man, they would have arrested him immediately. Wow. Wow. I so when I come out with this book, you ask me about the book. Yeah, when you ask me about the book, when I come out with the book, I'll be doing radio, video vlogs. So trust, I, I have a chance to come on your show. I love God with all my heart. But you cannot lynch a black man and put it in front of our eyes. And they, what they say, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people. Uh, That's okay. right. And some people are paying attention. We know that didn't make sense what they tried to show us. And the people that's behind putting out this movie and all this stuff about OJ year after year after year after year for 20 years, follow the money. Cato Kalin yeah. and his maniac friends. Wow. Thank you so much, Mr. James Cannon, for uh, joining us today. I'm going to be very uh, truthful and honest with you and my listeners. I have learned so much. And when I gave uh, that quote to Albert a, a, a week ago, actually, to give to you, I, I mean, I didn't know where this was going to go. It, I, we know you're Nick Cannon's father, but you really just took us in a whole totally different direction and showed us um, – you know, behind the scenes, the, the mindset of being awake and what it is with uh, black men and black women. I hope that you will be open to doing, you know, more video teachings about that subject. I think it will be great guidance uh, implementation for our culture and also workshops because that's something that, honestly, it has to be worked. That is a work you're dealing with. Uh, people that were separated through slavery and are just hurt, hurt, hurt all the way around, hurt all the way around. And so we need um, workshops, just like how we go to school and pursue education and businesses. We really need to go to some seminars and teachers that uh, can teach us these uh, type of things and how to uh, become more connected. So thank you well, for planning happen. another thing. Not to interrupt, but we, we are doing a whole bunch with black youth. That's the start of everything with the black youth nowadays. You know what I'm saying? So we're okay. going to be doing a whole lot in the future uh, between me, me, Nick, and, um, and James with the youth. And that's that, like I said, that's the whole start of everything to change, to make a change. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not trying to get into what, we, what we're about to do, but, you know, I just had to mention that. All right. Well, thank you both so much. I truly appreciate it. Please keep in touch with KRGN FM, Brother James Cannon, and let us know what you have going on and also our listeners. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for tuning in to the Good Morning Show. Be blessed. Be blessed. Appreciate it.